So the United States is finding that it no longer has the resources to dominate the globe the way it once did, uh, and that it's going to have to work with more uh, different countries uh, to create the types of coalitions, the type of balance the United States will need over the long term uh, to advance its interests and its values. Now, the declining resources situation is exacerbated uh, by uh, the political disarray uh, in the United States. Uh, it is clear that we have major uh, socioeconomic problems uh, that we have to face up to and confront uh, many of these that we have put off dealing with for uh, for the past uh, decade, decade uh, or, or longer. Uh, we have a profound polarization uh, in the United States. Uh, we talk of red states uh, and blue states uh, and see very little in common between, uh, between the two. And in the absence of this unity, uh, it's very difficult for an administration to tap the resources that we still have, the tremendous resources we still have to advance American goals on the, on the global stage. And so the first, uh, and I think most significant challenge and task for the United States is actually to put its own house in order, uh, to try to rebuild a sense of uh, national unity, a consensus about what the role of the United States should be in the world, uh, and how we should conduct our foreign policy going forward. Uh, the United States also needs uh, to deal with this political disarray, overcome uh, the polarization in our society, uh, to build up our educational system uh, so that the United States can maintain its technological edge uh, in the years ahead. And that also means that the United States uh, is going to have to maintain very close contacts with those other centers of technological innovation across the globe uh, that foster uh, even greater uh, creativity uh, among, uh, among the world's scientists. Uh, so there is a major domestic challenge uh, that lies before the United States. Uh, when we think about uh, the global environment, uh, as I said, the United States is not going to be in a position to dominate the world at once, uh, as it once did. Uh, we can talk about a US-led international order, uh, but increasingly, uh, if there's going to be an international order, it's going to have to be an order that is led by the United States uh, and many, many other countries. Uh, in a multipolar environment, such as the one that we have today, uh, the challenge for the United States is to build a global equilibrium uh, among the major powers, uh, the middle range powers, uh, that is favorable to the advance of American interests and values around the globe. And what that means is that the United States at a minimum is going to have to have functioning and one would hope constructive relations with all the other major global powers. That includes China, uh, that includes Europe, that includes India, that includes Japan, and that I would argue includes Russia as well. Uh, this gets to the third question of where Russia fits in. Uh, Russia, to my mind, to my mind, is going to be a key, key pillar of the global system for many, many years, and indeed decades into the future. Uh, despite the fact that it's clear that Russia faces its own significant set uh, of domestic problems that will challenge the, the wisdom and abilities of its leadership uh, in the years ahead. But we need to remember uh, that Russia is still the largest country in the world spanning 11 time zones. It's still the country with the largest endowment of natural resources by far uh, in the world today, including all those uh, elements that are necessary for modern uh, production, uh, modern production, mo mo modern, uh, modern manufacturing, uh, particularly uh, the production of the electronics uh, that have become such a central factor in socioeconomic and political life. Uh, around the globe. Uh, the United, uh, Russia also, as we've learned, uh, uh, particularly over the past uh, past uh, couple of months, uh, is one of the richest countries in agricultural resources. Uh, after the uh, trying times of the Soviet Union, Russia has returned as a major exporter of agricultural goods, uh, particularly grain, and become a central uh, factor uh, in the global food equation. Uh, Russia also retains a vast nuclear arsenal, one of the two great nuclear 
uh, superpowers in the world today. And that is going to be a significant element until we figure out a way uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons uh, as a uh, an element of uh, of warfare. Uh, uh, and that might, uh, to my mind, is something that will only occur uh, in the very distant future. Uh, Russia also has a tremendous wealth of oil and gas, uh, which is going to make it a key player on the global stage as long as fossil fuels uh, remain a significant element in the energy mix. And once again, despite the promise of renewables uh, and, other, uh, and other efforts that uh, the West in particular is undertaking to deal with the problems of climate change, oil and gas are still going to be a major component of the energy mix 15, 20, and 30 years into the future. And finally, uh, Russia has a geographic location uh, that makes it uh, an important player in all the major zones of economic uh, and industrial activity in the world today. It borders on Europe, it borders on, uh, on Northeast Asia, it borders on South Asia, uh, it borders on the Middle East, uh, which is not so much a, a, uh, a major industrial uh, center, but does retain uh, a, uh, natural resources that are critical to the global economy. And finally, Russia also borders on the Arctic, uh, an area that is being opened up by, by climate change and actually gives Russia uh, something of a border with that last major center uh, of global economic activity which is North America. Uh, so Russia, to my mind, will remain a, a central pillar of the global uh, environment going forward. Now, you hear and you have heard in the recent uh, past uh, a lot of conversation about uh, how brittle the Russian system is uh, and the potential for uh, the Russia to uh, dis disintegrate uh, the, way, uh, the way the Soviet Union did in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I think that uh, uh, that assessment is well overdrawn. Uh, the fact is that, in, that Russia now, uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, is largely uh, an ethnic Russian country. 80% of the population uh, is ethnic Russian. And I know of no case in history uh, where a country that homogenous has broken up. Indeed, the only country uh, of tremendous ho 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 homogeneity that came close to breaking up was actually the United States in the middle of the 19th century uh, during the Civil War. Um, so uh, simply on the basis of that uh, situation, it is unlikely that Russia is going to break up uh, over the, uh, over the uh, uh, not over the long term, but in, uh, in the very near, in the near future. There's a potential, of course, to lose the North Caucasus um, for various reasons. Uh, always been a troubled part of the of the Russian state, the Russian Empire. But the loss of the North Caucasus does very little to change Russia's global position uh, as a major power uh, in world affairs. Uh, if Russia uh, is going to uh, disintegrate, uh, it's not going to disintegrate because of domestic reasons. It will have to be broken up. Uh, and that would require outside powers uh, to try to undermine uh, and seize parts of the Russian state. I think the Russian state uh, will be strong enough to prevent that. And certainly we have seen no uh, country along Russia's borders that has uh, evinced any interest in trying to seize Russian territory uh, over the, uh, in, the past, uh, uh, in the past decade. And I see none on the horizon that would look uh, to that goal uh, in the next uh, two, three, or one more decades. So Russia is going to remain a significant global actor, and the United States is going to have to deal with it. And that comes to the final question of what we should be trying to do with Russia today uh, and the challenges that we face. Uh, how do we deal with the short-term crisis in order to uh, have a long-term constructive relationship with Russia, uh, a relationship that allows us to make Russia a central actor uh, in a new global, global equilibrium uh, that advances American interests and advances American values? How do we uh, include Russia in a way that helps us channel China's growing power and ambitions in ways that are not harmful uh, to American interests uh, and 
uh, American values. Um, obviously, the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine creates a, a tremendous challenge uh, for how we think about this and what we do. Uh, it, Russia is challenging the United States now uh, across a broad range uh, of issues. And Ukraine, uh, uh, for all the focus that it's received in recent months, uh, re is really only one element of a much broader challenge. Um, and that is the uh, one uh, that we're going to have to deal with, the challenge to European security, uh, the challenge uh, to the rules-based international order, uh, the growing alignment with, with China uh, that undermines uh, American uh, American interests going forward. So what, what should we be doing now in order to prepare the ground uh, for a more constructive relationship with Russia? Uh, first, uh, I would argue uh, that the United States, the West more broadly speaking, uh, has a, an interest in thwarting whatever Russia's ambitions are in Ukraine uh, at this point um, in defeating uh, Russia's grandest ambition, territorial ambitions uh, with regard to Ukraine. And that means that the United States, the West more broadly, should be continuing to provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs in order to push back against the, uh, the Russian assault. Uh, we need to build up our deterrent uh, capabilities uh, in NATO, particularly in the, the countries, the vulnerable countries along the NATO Russia frontier, the Baltic states, Poland, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria to a lesser extent. Uh, we need to integrate uh, quickly Sweden and Finland into NATO. I think a, a significant element of deterrence uh, and defense uh, in the North uh, uh, when we deal with Russia and creating as much of a united Europe and united West uh, as we possibly can uh, in order to, to deal uh, with the Russia challenge. Uh, and doing this, I think, is critical uh, to creating an environment in which sometime in the future, we can normalize relations with Russia uh, and begin to construct uh, a, a more durable European uh, security architecture. I think we need to understand uh, how difficult this is going to be because uh, what we're undertaking in the West now uh, is, in a sense, uh, a, an effort that expands the Euro-Atlantic uh, community eastward to Russia's border and pushes Russia out of Europe as a major actor. Uh, and as we all know, historically, Russia's interaction with NATO, its ability to influence developments on the continent has been a significant element of the way it thinks of itself as a great power. And when you think about it, Russia demonstrated that it was a great uh, that it was a great power uh, on the great European battlefield over the past two to three centuries at the great diplomatic conferences. Think of the Conference of Vienna, uh, the Alta Conference, for example. And so psychologically, uh, we have to deal with the fact uh, that Russia is being driven out of Europe, uh, and that has an impact on the way they're going to relate to Europe going forward. Uh, so we need to, as I said, first to uh, toward Russia's ambitions in Ukraine. Uh, but we also need to do this uh, in a way that leaves open the possibility for more constructive relations uh, in the future. And the two challenges I think we face, uh, which are quite complex, uh, which I won't go into great detail, but I'll just uh, lay them out now, uh, and I'll leave it to you to, to try to think of the solutions, is that we need to pursue our policy in Ukraine in a way that one, doesn't further alienate Russia, uh, that we need to demonstrate uh, that there is a way back for Russia to more constructive relations uh, once this conflict is over, and depending on how that conflict ends. That means that the United States uh, and the West uh, needs to, to recognize that Russia does have legitimate security concerns. We need to convey in our words and our actions that we're prepared to deal in a responsible uh, fashion with those uh, security concerns uh, going forward, and that there is, in fact, a way in which Russia can feel secure, uh, as uh, along with the countries of Europe uh, and the United States, more broadly speaking. Uh, the second uh, is that we need to uh, structure our sanctions regime uh, in a way uh, that uh, 
doesn't totally cripple the, uh, the Russian economy over the long term. Uh, we don't want to see uh, the, the cratering of the Russian economy. We need a country uh, for our own purposes uh, that might not be as strong as the Soviet Union was in challenging us, uh, but not so weak uh, that it can govern uh, in an effective fashion this vast territory uh, that, it, uh, that it occupies and controls at this point. Uh, how we do that, uh, I think, is a, a difficult question. We need to target our sanctions in a way that undermine Russia's ability to conduct uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, but not in such a way uh, that we eliminate the future foundations uh, of economic growth that will allow Russia uh, to be a, a major actor, uh, to be a, a major uh, technological power uh, over the longer term. And so we need to create or lay the foundations for Russia uh, that can work with the United States and be a, an important uh, and constructive player on the global stage. Uh, both these questions, the alienation of Russians uh, and uh, the crippling of the, uh, uh, the Russian economy are two big issues uh, that are being debated in Washington today. Uh, but I don't think by any stretch of the imagination uh, that we have come to a firm conclusion or the right policy uh, as we go forward.